Hi everyone, I'm Karen. And I'm Natalie. This is The Next Page, the podcast of the UN Geneva Library and Archives. Hi Natalie. Hi Karen. So we had quite a busy week here at the podcast. Uh, We released two episodes in the past few days. Yes, indeed. So if you missed it, we released episode 36 uh, on Wednesday with our own colleagues here in the library and archives, Colin Wells and Gudrun Beja, who take us on a journey back in time, I guess, exploring some of the League of Nations archives in a conversation we've called the world's most traveled document. So anyone interested in history, please go check that one out. But today we're actually looking at philosophy. We learn from Professor Suleiman Dian. He is a Senegalese philosopher, the author of several books, and also is currently teaching at Columbia University in New York, where he leads their Institute of African Studies and also teaches philosophy. Ah, yes. He joined us recently for an event here at UN Geneva. Yes, he did. He joined us for a recent event to mark the UN's 75th anniversary this year, an event called the Multilateralism of the Future. And it was part of a wider event. So it was a short message, uh, but really fascinating. So we invited him back for a deeper conversation on basically his life's work in philosophy and how this connects to like our daily lives and the global issues we're facing. Amazing. I feel that philosophy is often seen as highly academic and just not part of our everyday lives. So I'm really interested to hear more. Yeah, that was also a thought that I had. And he shares the philosophical concepts that he thinks we really need to bring back to revive in order to collectively face our common challenges. So that was really eye opening for me. And I think also what was really interesting was to hear his views on diversity in philosophy itself. So not just the common philosophies we know from the West, but also the incredible bridges that connect Islamic, African, and other philosophies throughout history. It's really cool. Awesome. As always, we have more resources in our podcast notes, so please don't forget to browse through them for even more learning. And now, let's take a listen. Professor Dian, thank you so much for joining us on the next page. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. With pleasure. You're joining us from Columbia University in New York, where you're the director of the Institute of African Studies, professor of French and of philosophy. But you do have a fascinating journey that began well before your time at the university. Would you mind sharing a little more about yourself? How did you come to be interested in philosophy and dedicating your your life to studying it and researching it and teaching it? Well, I'm glad you're, you're, you're asking that question. I just finished actually the manuscript of a autobiography that I wrote and I re- revisited my own trajectory. So somehow I'm going to summarize for you uh, what I have finished writing. I'm Senegalese. I did all my studies in Senegal up to the end of high school. And this is when I went to France to study there. While I was in Senegal, I saw myself as pursuing a career of engineer. Actually, the path I was following up to the point when I reached the last year of high school, I was doing math and I saw myself doing doing math. I discovered philosophy, obviously, when I was a, a senior in high school. And then I fell in love with this, uh, with this discipline. So when I went to France uh, to, for my higher education, I was actually hesitating between two paths. One would have led me to the city of Lyon, where I was admitted to a uh, school of engineers called Institut National des Sciences Appliquées, or follow this kind of, I would call it an elite path, uh, which is going to Lycée Louis Le Grand, and that would have led me, if successful, to École Normale Supérieure, this important elite uh, school in the French system. After hesitation, I decided to stay in Paris to go to Lycée Louis Le Grand, and this uh, led me to choosing the path of philosophy. I was fortunate enough to be successful for the test that took me to École Normale uh, Supérieure, where I had great, great, great teachers, 
And uh, so I was very, very happy with that. And in a way, I found a way of reconciling my two loves, my love for philosophy and my love for mathematics, when I decided to specialize in the history and philosophy of mathematics and, and logic. This is what my uh, higher education in France uh, was. After that, I went back home. I decided uh, not to stay in Europe, not to stay in France, but to go back home and teach at the University of Dakar, which is now named the Université Cher Antonio. And I was there for 20 years. I um, created two uh, different curricula that I thought were important One was a curriculum in uh, logic, of course, and uh, philosophy of science. The other one was in Islamic philosophy, which is not something I had been formally trained in, but that was, in a way, my family background. So that is what allowed me to be able to hold the position and to create the curriculum. And uh, I'm very happy I trained many students who are now teaching the class. After teaching there 20 years, when I was invited to join the faculty at Northwestern University, so I taught there for nine years, being a professor in the Department of Philosophy, in the Department of Religion, because my teaching in the philosophy, in Islamic philosophy, was part of the curriculum at the Department of Religion. I had also an appointment at the Program of African Studies. I insisted on my time at the Northwestern University because I was fortunate enough to be able to work at the Program of African Studies and at the Herkovitz Library. The Herkovitz Library is the greatest library in the world in, uh, in African studies very easily, maybe comparable to Library of Congress, maybe second to Library of Congress, because Library of Congress obviously has everything. But uh, this was a, a great time I had in, uh, at Northwestern University. So it was very difficult for me to, after nine years, to accept the invitation uh, to join the faculty at Columbia University. This was a time when uh, I wanted to join friends that I had at Columbia University. I wanted to be in New York, and uh, I was very happy to to join Columbia University in 2008. And this is where I am now. I'm teaching in the Department of French, but I'm teaching their philosophy. Because it was becoming interdisciplinary, uh, the, the department wanted me to come there and represent, in a way, both French philosophy, the history of French philosophy, and also uh, African philosophy. Amazing. I'm glad that you mentioned the different philosophies you've, you've encountered over these years, because that was a question I wanted to ask you, and that is diversity in philosophy itself. Some of, you've mentioned some of your research areas include the history of philosophy, but also Islamic philosophy, African philosophy and art and literature, and also French philosophy. Really, I guess, a tapestry of ideas from many cultures and and parts of the world. Why is this diversity important to you? And also, do you think, to the field of philosophy itself? Well, I think that uh, being true to the field of philosophy, being true to what philosophy truly is, is to pluralize it. I was trained in particularly narrow vision of the history of philosophy, which is unfortunately the way in which uh, history of philosophy is taught and is still taught, which is to say that, well, philosophy started in Greece and as a miracle. So this idea of a Greek miracle, the Greek people being a particular humanity and creating philosophy because of who they were. And then from Greece, it was transmitted to the Roman world and from the Roman world to medieval Latin Christianity and, and so on and so forth. So uh, philosophy was considered to be uniquely European and to be uniquely the expression of the European destiny in a, in a way. But even if we narrow it down to just Greek philosophy, of course, it is absurd to think that philosophy started in Greece, the Greek philosophers themselves never say that philosophy started with them. If you read Plato, he would credit Egypt for many aspects of, of philosophy. 
and so on and so forth. It is just absurd because philosophy is truly an expression of the humanity of the human being uh, wherever she is which means that questions about why there is existence and why this existence and so on and so forth. These are profoundly human questions that define the humanity of the human being. So it is absurd to consider that it had cradled a particular location for its birth and so on and so forth. But even if we narrow down things to just consider Greek philosophy, the transmission of Greek philosophy was not this path that led from Athens, let's say, to Rome and from Rome to these European uh, intellectual capitals, Heidelberg or London or, or Paris. It's not true. Greek philosophy followed as well a path that led from Athens to Baghdad, to Cordoba, Spain, at a time when that region known as Andalusia was Islamic, to, to Fez in Morocco or to Timbuktu. Uh, in the heart of Africa. This is something that is not known at all. But in Timbuktu, in the 15th, 16th century, people were being trained in Aristotelian logic, discussing Aristotelian logic centuries before they saw any uh, Western European man coming on their, on their shores. So why is it important? Because if you take just medieval philosophers themselves, They were talking to each other across their religions and their regions. Let's remember that Thomas Aquinas, if we want to choose one particular medieval figure of Latin Christianity, Thomas Aquinas, before he was sanctified by the church and became St. Thomas, had been at one point accused of being a heretic because he was holding statements that were averroistic. That was the accusation. Now, how can you read Thomas Aquinas if you cannot exactly know this uh, Muslim philosopher, Averroes? His uh, name, Arabic name was Ibn Rushd, and Ibn Rushd has been Latinized as Averroes. So here is Thomas Aquinas building his own philosophical reflection in conversation with this Muslim philosopher, Averroes. And that is what medieval philosophy is a braid of histories bringing together Latin Christianity, but also Greek Christianity on the Byzantine side, that those people are also forgotten when we look at medieval philosophy. These people were in conversation with each other, and this is how we should be thinking of the history of philosophy. We need to restitute to the history of of philosophy its plurality, and we need also to pluralize the languages of philosophy, because philosophy has been translated in different languages and that translation continues. So, for example, the translation of Greek philosophy into Arabic was a very important aspect of the history of philosophy, because you are translating from a given language in the European language with a certain structure into a Semitic language with a different Uh, grammar in in a way. So that in itself is a very important aspect of the history of philosophy. The UN itself has six languages and is committed to multilingualism as, as of course, part of our work and part of our our values and our spirit um, in in multilateralism. And so with thanks to my colleague who actually had watched one of your videos from Cornell University a few years ago, we did a lecture called the philosopher as translator and how important it is that we understand language is also about concepts and that if we able to think through another language, it's able to, we are also able to think through another world's view. What do you think of this in terms of plurality, as you mentioned? Let me, let me start with something uh, funny, I would say. There is this wonderful uh, science fiction movie, Arrival, which was a very successful movie. I've seen this one, yeah. (laughs) You've seen that, yes, I'm sure you've seen it. And these ET people, these extraterrestrial uh, people coming to visit us, we don't know what they want from us, and we send them this wonderful linguist to communicate with them. And uh, the, the movie is about them actually wanting to teach us their language not just for the sake of communication, 
But because their language, the structure of their language is such that their conception of time, which is expressed in their language, is radically different from our own conception of time, where we have a past and then a present and a future. And what they end up teaching this uh, uh, linguist is not just a few uh, aspects of their language, but to think differently time and to be able actually to live in different uh, times in a way. So she can see the future in the present and so on and so forth. So this is allegorical. And what it expresses uh, is that each language in a way is a certain, what I have called earlier, a philosophical grammar. This is an expression from, from Nietzsche and a certain perspective on the word. So uh, philosophy is defined as this uh, particular demanding posture where you do not leave anything unexamined. Well, why don't we examine also the fact that when we are philosophizing, we are doing that in a particular language and ask ourselves what the formulation of the problems and questions and methods and procedures that we are using in our philosophical reasoning, what do those methods, etc., owe to the fact that we are speaking a certain language? Would Tarski's definition of truth be the same if he was not thinking about it in English, but in Akan language? So those are interesting and important questions to raise. And looking at the fact that when you speak a certain language, the formulations that you use are connected, deeply connected to that language dependent on the fact that that is the language that you are speaking. So what translation adds to that is precisely a test. You are testing your thought through translation into another different language and seeing what is the universality of your own thinking in that case. If you say, for example, the most important philosophical question is the question of being. Well, okay. Every philosopher who has read uh, Parmenides or Heidegger would agree with you. But then you want to uh, step back and think, okay, my goodness, the reason why I'm saying that is that I'm speaking a language in which when you add ing to the verb to be, you go from the verb to be to the substantive being. This happens, you, you do the same thing, you have that same grammatical possibility when you are speaking any of the Indo-European languages. What happens if I step out of these Indo-European languages and speak another language? So translation is, again, a philosophical test. And we need to be able to examine our philosophical questions and problematics by submitting them to the test of translation, the test of the foreign, to, to use the title of Antoine Berman, this philosopher of translation. The test of the foreign is a good way of examining our thoughts and their formulation. Absolutely. Well, even with um, one language itself, depending on, on our own biases, our own upbringing, our own thoughts, opinions, <laughs> we can even translate our own language in, in different ways. Exactly. Right. <laughs> On this topic still of diversity, I wanted to ask you, when you are teaching about this diversity um, and bringing it into to teach your students, how can we ensure this diversity is taught and discussed and, and debated so that we can branch out from, I guess, very one-way streets of how we, how we see things? That's a very important and crucial question because obviously the way in which you change approaches, I mentioned decolonizing the history of philosophy uh, earlier, is by decolonizing the curriculum. How do you translate this into a curriculum? One could look at uh, what are departments in philosophy doing? Usually they might want to add to their traditional curriculum a 
course or a seminar on Islamic philosophy, say, which is already a good thing. But the best way to do things is probably to consider questions or problems or concepts from many different perspectives. Let's say, for example, you look at the concept of religion philosophically. Well, this is a good time to have that concept accompanied with extracts from many different philosophers coming from many different regions. So instead of having Western philosophy juxtaposed to Islamic philosophy, juxtaposed to, uh, let's say, Chinese philosophy, you would ask yourself, okay, the concept of a person, what does it mean to be human? And what does Islamic philosophy and Western philosophy and Chinese philosophy, what do they say about what it means to be human. In other words, you would not just oppose philosophical traditions, you would put them in conversation with one another around common problems and common questions and common concepts. I really like this idea of not juxtaposing these philosophies, but kind of seeing how they fit into the same puzzle. Yes. Let's take, for example, when you study the so-called pre-Socratics, their main question was, what is the origin of everything? Heraclitus would say the origin of everything is fire. Uh, someone else would say it is water, and so on and so forth. So if you decide to have a curriculum where you ask the question about the radical origin of everything, and then you bring these pre-Socratics, and you bring also African cosmologies or Chinese cosmologies, because all these cosmologies were precisely about what is the radical origin of everything that exists. That would be a good way of doing things and not juxtaposing them, but bringing them together around one single question and one single problematics. Yes. This leads us, I guess, what I wanted to ask you next, and that is how all of this, how what you learn and and teach and study relates to, I guess, the problems, the issues we're facing today. We've just come out of, of a big week, the last week in the United States, but also a big year for the world with a global pandemic, COVID-19, and of course, really pressing global challenges that we've been facing for, for quite some years now. Um, the climate crisis, many issues that are global in nature. How does philosophy and its principles seep into our life, our everyday experience? Or how can we use it, our understanding, to be able to move through these global challenges? Well, uh, this is a great question, actually, because I think that the, the, the challenges we are facing now, two natural challenges, I would call them, and one political challenge. The two natural challenges would be the challenge of, the, of climate change. Uh, although when I say natural, I'm not uh, denying at all that we human beings are responsible, but this is something which is in the environment, so to say. The other is the pandemics, this virus which is threatening humanity and manifesting our vulnerability. And the political one is the challenge of all these populisms. I mean, uh, the world is today fragmented by this populism, which is just tribalism. The idea of my tribe first, America first, and then uh, demonizing uh, the other, the one who doesn't belong to the tribe the migrant, the refugee, the one who doesn't have the same religion as myself, who doesn't have the same skin color, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And unfortunately, you have many, many political parties whose only program actually is to demonize the other and stir up, so to say, tribal sentiment. And what is the connection between these three? If I take the pandemics, one thing the virus, the coronavirus revealed is that for it, the world is one. I mean, the world is just one tiny country for the virus. It traveled across this world overnight. And so the response we should be having is that, yes, indeed, we are one single country. We are one single humanity and have what I would call a politics of our shared humanity in response to that pandemics. In the same way, we need to have a politics of our shared humanity to face 
climate change. The fact that we were able to have all these uh, meetings that led to the Paris Agreement, that was great. That is the humanity coming together, realizing the fragility of their habitat. And this is a wonderful figure of what universality means. In the same vein, in a way, this is also overcoming the fragmentation into tribes and thinking anew the concept of humanity. And this is what leads me to what I was saying about philosophy. Philosophical ideal is the ideal of cosmopolitanism, from the Stoics to Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu with the concept of Ubuntu, being human together. This is the best translation of this Bantu word of Ubuntu. So the old notion of humanism, the old notion of cosmopolitanism, being all of us citizens of the same world, are philosophical concepts that we need to reactivate today because these are the concepts we have as a response to the challenges we are facing. Or when it comes to the pandemics or when it comes to climate change, having a politics of our shared humanity is something that we need and philosophy is truly itself, I believe, when uh, philosophers consider themselves to be what Edmund Husserl called the civil servants of humanity. The civil servants of humanity. Absolutely. He used that expression. Yes. I'll pose this question um, then to you. How can the civil servants of humanity communicate to us how we can get through this together? Just being human, as you mentioned. Well, it can be done. It can be done. In a way, uh, we can see the way in which it worked when we take the, the example, the microcosm of South Africa. I mentioned Ubuntu, this concept that Mandela and Desmond Tutu put to work when they were trying to build a new South Africa, which would be stepping out of politics of tribes. Apartheid was a politics of tribes and fragmentation. The, the very definition of apartheid before even adding racism to it was the idea that human cultures are separate. They are just juxtaposed. They follow their own logic and their own path, and they basically do not communicate. So everybody has to have their own separate path towards their own development. That is the, the strict definition of apartheid. So this was a glorification of tribes. And Ubuntu was a way of saying, let's just leap out of tribes into our shared humanity. And this is what I'm transferring, so, so to say, to the global world. We are in a world of apartheid today, of global apartheid. I am following the philosophy of French philosopher Henri Bergson, who in this wonderful book of his, The Two Sources of Morality and Religion, ended on the idea of the open society as being the society open to humanity in general. Ubuntu is an open-ended task which is still to be achieved. So humanity is not a state, but a task. And that is the fundamental teaching of Ubuntu. Achieving our humanity together would be the best translation for that. Because in achieving, you have the idea of a task to be pursued again and again and continuously. The work continues. On some of the, the thoughts you mentioned there about, I guess, economies, markets, politics, but also uh, bringing in technology, in many ways our world has changed and technology is has been a part of our lives for a long time now, but more so in 2020 with COVID-19 and basically transferring all of our life uh, online from work to, to other things. We're connected now in all spheres from morning to evening. We are connected through that way and there are many benefits to that, but perhaps also maybe some, some consequences as well with, with the rapid spread of, of technology. Do you think our humanity is is impacted in some way by, by these things? Or is it bringing humanity closer together? I think that these technologies that bring us together are like uh, the famous Aesop's tongue, the best and the worst thing at the same <laughs> time. 
Why is that? Let's look at the pandemics. You and I are now, right now, communicating through Zoom. I am teaching my classes through Zoom. And I believe that this is uh, something that is going to stay. In other words, when we hopefully soon get back into a world without COVID, the fact that we have been communicating through Zoom, especially in uh, higher education, is going to stay. I do not need to travel now to, to go to be part of a dissertation committee. can do that so easily with, with Zoom. Many things that I was doing, traveling, etc., will be done uh, through Zoom. It has truly brought us together and created a, a community at a time when we need to be socially distancing. At the same time, what we are seeing now is that the same tool that should be creating community and bringing us together can also tear us apart by being a tool used by the tribalisms. And the whole discussion right now about Facebook uh, uh, and democracy, how people who are trying to just take any credibility out of democracy are using Facebook, are using fake, fake news. So like-minded people gather through Facebook and what they are doing is not open themselves to others, but close themselves and create their own tribal language, their own tribal references, and so on and so forth, and develop out of that a language of, of hate. So it can go both ways. So these are questions we have to face. We have all the tools, the technological tools to be one humanity, but those same technological tools can be used to further fragmentation and tribalism at the same time. You mentioned the concept of being open when we are talking together. As a philosopher, can you... Share with us your tips or your ideas on how we can better listen to each other so that we can be open. What would you recommend? One thing in this case is that we educate ourselves in philosophy, I, I was going to say. <laughs> in the use of this uh, faculty in us, which is rightly called understanding. You know, when philosophers talk about human understanding, they are obviously talking about a cognitive faculty. But that cognitive faculty is also the faculty by which we understand each other. That is something that we share. So understanding, human understanding, is not just understanding the world out there, but also understanding each other because we share it. So when we educate our understanding, at the same time, we educate our own capacity to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, as the saying goes. And this is the whole teaching of philosophy. We have to remember that one of our many philosophical ancestors, Socrates, that was his, his whole teaching was to say, well, why don't you now look at things from this one perspective? That is the condition of true rational discussion. That is how we transform the public square where everybody comes with their own understanding. And I'm playing on the different meanings of understanding here. They are capable of listening to somebody else. Decentering, the capacity to decenter is actually the fundamental condition for um, the capacity to communicate. And this is why uh, we praise actually the freedom of expression which is being a problem right now in France, as you know, the, the fundamental idea behind freedom of expression was to say that if ideas circulate freely without fear, the best will come out of it. There we go. So we, of course, cannot have a conversation on this podcast without talking about multilateralism. And I wanted to ask you about, is there a role and has there been a role of philosophy in multilateralism? Has it been evident in our history? And can you share anything on that? I think that I will connect multilateralism in its philosophical meaning with what I just said about the free circulation of, of ideas. And I believe that multilateralism is the, the attempt 
the open-ended, continuously pursuit of the realization of that free circulation of, of ideas. So this is what multilateralism is about, realizing that challenges we are facing are challenges that we need to face together as one humanity, and in so doing, that you do not have just the powerfuls and the less powerfuls. And all human voices count. They are all important, equally important. That is the true meaning of multilateralism. And so it is a necessity in the world in which we live. And philosophy can be seen as being precisely about that. That seems like a great way to end. Thank you so much for sharing, Professor Diane. We, we like to, to end with, with just one final thought from you. We covered a lot of ground today. If there's one thing that you would like listeners to, to really remember and take away, what would it be from this conversation? Well, let me say that it would be humanism, actually. Or to use an African word for it, Ubuntu. I think that is the final word. At this time, when we have all these concepts circulating about the post-human, the transhuman, we have to come back, I believe, to the fundamental aspect of what it means to be human and what it means to share our humanity and what it means to achieve our humanity together and in reciprocity. I am because you are, as one African philosopher, John Beattie, famously translated also Ubuntu, is really some fundamental truth, human truth, that we should be getting back to and understanding what is happening to us right now, the threat of the pandemics, the threat of climate change, the threat of fragmentation and tribalism under that light. Ubuntu, being human together. Merci beaucoup, Professor Diane. It's really a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for taking the time. Je vous en prie, c'était un plaisir. Merci.